Thanks for joining us today. We're going to give it just a couple of minutes here and let all of our attendees um, join us. And then I will start with a brief welcome. So just waiting for um, some more of our attendees to come in. Thanks for joining us. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Um, we're here for the November edition of our uh, Pearson Lunch and Learn series with Maria Teresa Ronderos. Thank you so much. Uh, we're excited to host her today in conversation with our Institute Director and University Professor James A. Robinson. Um, but before I turn it over to Professor Robinson for our introduction, I'd like to explain how we'll handle the Q&A session later in the program. If you have a question for our speaker, you have a couple of options for submission. One is to use the Q&A feature available at the bottom of your Zoom window, and our moderator, Alex Carr, will then ask the question on your behalf. You can also choose to raise your hand and be called on to ask your question live on camera or using the audio only feature. Uh, please note that we preferred the first three questions to come from our U Chicago students and we'll do our best to field every question in the time allotted. Thank you again for joining us and I hope that you enjoy this conversation. Okay, it's me now, is it? Oh, no. Yes, okay, great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Welcome, welcome everybody. And, and uh, we're very excited to have Maria Teresa Ronderost here today. Maria Teresa is an old, uh, old friend of mine who I got to know probably 10 years ago when I was doing research on the paramilitaries. And every time I asked someone a question about the paramilitaries, they said, oh, you have to talk to Maria Teresa. At the time, Maria Teresa was running a project called Verdad Abieta, which is still ongoing and which is an amazing uh, kind of virtual project on paramilitarism, the roots of paramilitarism, the consequences of paramilitarism. And then she wrote the sort of definitive book on Colombian paramilitarism, uh, Recycled Wars, uh, which is, you know, it's not in English, unfortunately, but, but if you want to understand that phenomenon, that's the, that's the book to start. So she's, you know, she has a, you can look her up. She's on Wikipedia. She's done all sorts of things uh, in, in, you know, in Colombian journalism with Soros, uh, with the Open Society Foundation. And currently she's the director and the co-founder of the Latin American Center for Investigative uh, Journalism. So, uh, so, so what we're gonna do is Maria Teresa, th this is a sort of exploratory thing that she and I have been talking about for some time, uh, a kind of thinking about uh, inequality in Colombia. And, and so she's gonna give a presentation and just get the ball rolling. And then I'm going to reflect on what she's saying and we may talk to each other or we may let you talk to us, which perhaps would be more productive. So without further ado, I'll shut up and let Maria Teresa talk. Thank you so much, James, and thank you to everybody who's here. Yeah, this is a kind of exploration, and some of my examples are not going to come from Colombia because I'm now working in lots of countries in Latin America doing investigative reporters, so the examples and the ideas come from all over sometimes. But I'll, so I'm just basically concentrate also in Colombia because I think this is very noticeable in Colombia. So, uh, so what, we're to, what we've been talking with James and what we we're trying to do is how do we tell this story? How do we investigate and pinpoint and bring down uh, and show and make visible inequality in Colombia? But it's not about the numbers. Um, so it's about this distance between rich and poor that the cartoon shows. Um, so yes, as you know, probably Latin America is one of the most unequal uh, regions in the world. There's particularly 
four or five countries that are particularly unequal, like Colombia. But this is about numbers. This is about concentration of wealth, Gini, coefficient, distribution of, of, of resources or of income. And we're not really talking about that. We are not talking exactly about you know, what is generally called as discrimination, like gender or ethnicity or rural versus urban or religion or political discrimination. It is, it has a little bit of everything. It is indeed related to material inequalities, um, but it is, it is also harder to see. And I, I chose this cartoon of a fantastic cartoonist we have in Colombia, which is called Matador, because it's not about the poor on the left and the rich on the right and the millions of, of, of pesos in the right. It's about that line. It's about that line that somehow there you can see it, but it's a very invisible line. It has to do how rich and poor relate to each other in Colombia and, and how it's ingrained in society and, um, and how there are spaces and non-written sort of rules of the game of how you relate to these spaces. And when spaces become incredibly democratic, we're going to see then elites usually or leaders or rulers try to, to stop to stop them to become equal space, people where people can just walk and be equal. Uh, it also has to do with how people behave. And, and one of the anecdotes I told James about very early on when we were talking about this, when I was a little kid, I used to have a friend and she was very well off. She was of a, a, a Bosch family. Her, her, her house was beautiful, was made by this famous architect and it had a chapel and a movie theater. It was like a, going to a palace for me. And so in the afternoons we would go and play with my friend. And one day her mother who was very posh, sort of pulled us aside and introduced me to her friends who were also very posh ladies having tea. And she said, this is my friends, my daughter's friends from Tierra Caliente, from the hotlands, good people from the hotlands. And this was immediately, I didn't understand much why she would introduce me like that. Um, and, and of course, immediately, uh, but I somehow I knew I was being discriminated against. I knew I was being told like down, spoken down to, and I didn't understand and I felt very horrible. And from that day on, I, I was always not trying to, to, to meet this lady because I thought, and she was a wonderful lady. The problem was that it was ingrained in her immediately this classification between who are you? So my family was also from Bogota, but my parents had lived for a long time in a small town in the hot lands. <laughs> so of course she immediately put me in that classification. So what inequality are we talking about? Uh, it is a painful experience. I think it's similar to discrimination, like for example, racial discrimination. Uh, but, uh, but it's further than that. It's much more generalized it's in all society. And it orders that, uh, you know, when you want to access justice or education or law enforcement, uh, just because how you talk, how you look, how you, who you are, immediately access becomes much more difficult. And it also hurts a lot when you're treated with as a, as a, it's like they're talking about human dignity. We're gonna see later a, a, a poster that I found in one of the protests talking about human dignity. Um, um, and then I love Mafalda, I don't, a lot, probably you don't know who Mafalda is. She's a very famous character, this little girl here. She's a very famous character in Argentina and she became a, an icon in all of Latin America. And she is uh, the, the, the drawer Kino of this, the, the, the cartoonist that died recently and he was revered. And she was like the one who asked all the questions about inequality in Latin America. And so her friend, Susanita, who likes to treat everybody with a lot of social distance, and she's very, she feels she's better than everybody. She says, it's very 
it's it's easy to it's very comfortable or it's easy to talk about equality when so, when someone else suffers inequality because she's always suffering with Mafalda's reference to inequality. So I have some examples and that's basically what I'm gonna to bring today. Um, so in a recent story we were doing with, with Clip, it was a big story about the, how Africans and people from Asia were coming, trying to get into the United States because of the European path became too dangerous. They're making their way through Latin America. So they're coming into Latin America and they cross the whole of the continent in order to get to Latin America. And when, well, sorry, to North America. And when I was uh, doing this story with my colleagues in a little, little town, beautiful town, because you can see the, the, the sea there, which is called uh, Capurganá. This is in, in the right in where Colombia meets Panama, right in the border. And that's where all the tourists, uh, sorry, all the migrants end up there because they need to cross to, to cross to Panama, but there's no roads, there's nothing. There's a very thick and very dangerous jungle uh, where lots of people die in that jungle crossing it on foot. It takes about a week. And just before they get there, these migrants go and buy their tickets for their boat and they are not allowed to take the same boats as tourists or locals. Um, they're, they're forced to take a later boat, usually when the sea is much rougher uh, and there's more danger. And, and it is because simply because they, they, they're scared to be seen together with them as if they were one of them. It's this separation. So elites, even elites of a small town like this, keep them apart. Keep, keep those who are lesser off or poorer or seen as less completely off. And it's even worse when you see the, the, the road, the path to Panama, there is like this beautiful path that you can walk. And if you're a tourist, just because of the way you look, you look like a tourist, you're only carrying your, you know, you're in your swimming suit. And you can easily walk down to La Miel, um, which is a little town in Panama and, and, and have a swim and be on the beach for the whole day and then come back to Colombia with a one hour walk. But, but immigrants are not allowed to go to Panama this way. That is blocked. They say they spook tourists. And so they're forced to take the long path into Panama, which is this amazingly dangerous path. We were able to count with colleagues and with lots of testimonies. About 106 people were, died between 216 and 220. And they could easily walk through the tourist road in one hour and be in Panama, and but they're not allowed to do that. And everybody seems to, to think it's okay. We I interviewed, I don't know how many people and nobody thinks this is a horrendous discrimination and a horrendous inequality for people like us. Now, what's other, other places where elites keep the barriers in Colombia? They, a lot of the oil companies or even other kinds of companies like coal, coal mining companies, they come and because security is bad, they pay extra money to the army and this is allowed, this is legal. And the army then receives money from these oil companies. And of course, they protect them in a different way that they protect the people. And sometimes even when we've had cases of oil companies violating human rights or joining up, with paramilitary forces or other forces, uh, people are completely helpless because authorities are actually being paid, but not corrupted. It is, is completely institutional. So, and everybody also thinks it's perfectly all right. We need to keep the oil companies protected, the people less important. So that's another kind of embedded um, kind of uh, inequality. And then you have, Cartagena, which is an incredible, beautiful place. You see one of the resorts left uh, with the sea and it's a beautiful place. And then you have poverty. It's probably one of the cities with the biggest um, uh, number of poor, poor people in Colombia because they all came from displaced from the war and they live, as you can see, very poorly. But when you go into the city, I was going to get this elevator uh, with my husband just taking an elevator and we see that a maid was going up the stairs and we asked her why don't you get the elevator she says where what floor are you going and she says 
floor 15. Why are you going by foot on to floor 15? And he said, oh, they won't allow me to take the elevator for, for, the, for the people. We, we have to take the elevator of service and this is broken, so we have to take the stairs. They won't allow me. And of course, we, we asked her to come with us in the elevator and she was all the time super scared that she would get into trouble because she was using an elevator that was used only for those who were the owners of the place. So as you can see, this kind of difference, discrimination or inequalities, very subtle and very, very, very horrid. And she didn't even realize that it was wrong. So, and then I have the story of Bogota. Um, so you see this map shows which are the neighborhoods where they have more homicides. So in the, in the south part of the city, which is the poorest part of the city, you have all these neighborhoods, the ones that are colored in yellow, have the highest number of homicides in Bogota. And all the blue ones have the less. And then you will go and see why. And then you realize that every single building in Colombia and a lot of the houses or neighborhoods have private guards. And because people can pay, they can have security. People who cannot pay, they, they, they are less safe. So, and everything is accepted. Nobody thinks that police should be the one taking care of you and not private guards. But then it obviously puts people in a different place in society. And then we were asking ourselves, this is a dynamic relation. This is not just about elites putting a lot of barriers of access. And I'm talking about this, this, this the anecdotes I shows are not, are just, I wanted to show the difficult places. Of course you have education and justice and all of that, but these are the places where it's not so clear. It's not so transparent. And I think the same happens with how the poor work around them. They need to work around them. Some of them couldn't survive with the, with the actual income differences. So how do they work around it? So of course they find a patron and, and politics has a lot to do with patronage politics in Colombia. It's very, very embedded. It, it has modernized in other countries and in Colombia to a certain extent, it has modernized in the cities where people do not depend from a patron. But in the, in the poorer neighborhoods and in the, in the smaller towns, everybody somehow works for some kind of political patron during the election because otherwise you know you won't you won't have access so they make sure they have the control of the access so that everybody has to go through them these politicians so that they can have education health public services whatnot and then if you have this patron it will allow you to get there and of course this difference this this makes them all, all the time on a lower level, trying, needing to beg, needing to bow, needing to ask for favors, something. Uh, and the other kind of patron is the, is the sort of miracle, <laughs> the miracle patron. I, this is a picture of people visiting the grave of Leo Kopp, who was the the owner of the, of the bigger beer company and the creator of a German or Leo Kopp. And they, this is his tomb in the central cemetery. And because he was nice to people and because he allowed people to, to become, to grow in their jobs or paid well or paid good salaries or whatever, there was this legend that he is a saint. And so people go and as you can see with a lot of faith, they. They, they pray in his ear and they into his monument and to bring flowers and it lives like that. The same with singer, tango singer, famous singer, Carlos Gardel in, in Medellin where he died uh, in his tomb in Buenos Aires is the same. La Difunta Correa is another one of these um, patron saints, popular saints, which are not Catholic saints or anything. They're just popular myths that people go and pay their respects and ask for everything that they cannot get. It's another way in their mind to feel, I have somebody in my favor. It's somebody that I protects me. And of course you can always go wrong. You can always go illegal. A lot of people in my country, believe me, 
have seen this social barrier and they go around it. And they, like one uh, gorilla woman that I interviewed uh, some time ago, she told me it's better to be a gorilla than to be a maid. That was my only two options as a woman in the countryside. And I prefer to be a gorilla. It looks much, much more fun than to be a maid. And of course, in the streets today of Colombia and in the countryside, people fight. People fight against this discrimination. They go out in the streets. They've been, we've had, we've had 283 protests this year. And this headline that I copied from some newspaper, it's every year, every semester, we have protests. People protest all day long. And this is a way, these are indigenous communities that just came a few days ago to the, to the plaza, central plaza in Bogota. And then I love this, this beautiful uh, poster that says, wake up a uh, 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 Colombia, a uh, uh, Colombia uh, for people, for more dignity, for uh, uh, peasants are broke, are in, 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 in poverty. We need dignity, which is very interesting. Then in this particular poster, of course, in many others, they do ask for more more, more, more education, more, etc. But here they're asking for dignity, and I think that's something a little bit different. Um, then the, there's another thing that happens is that the rich are they are they fear of being seen equal to the poor. I, I've never seen such a such a a, a, a strong um, attitude of being. Um, so for example, uh, they protect space, spaces like sidewalks, uh, when a major, sorry, when a major, this major Penalosa wanted to, to, to protect sidewalks for people to walk, there was a huge campaign, very much fed by the very rich people because they were mad that they couldn't use those spaces for their, for their cars, for their cars. But also because if people walk in the sidewalk and you walk side by side, then of course you, you end up looking like the same, like you're another poor person. Um, and also we just published a story about a mine uh, and a, in a, a mining company that it's trying to, to do a mine in, in Honduras in a public park. And we tried and, and, and peasant and the, the, the all people who live there are trying to protect the park. They're trying to do the right thing. And the owner of the, of the mine, we talked to him and he was saying, oh, no, no, they don't know what's good for them. What they desire is some Jesuit priests and some other people who have you know, manipulated them. And there's always, always this kind of idea when you interview a lot of the people in the elite in Latin America, poor people don't think for themselves. They're just being manipulated by somebody. And of course they don't have the right to for themselves. Uh, so you see this beautiful building in Santa Marta. Uh, you say it should have on the other side a beautiful street, but actually it doesn't. It has a, a street full of holes. Uh, and this is because they were telling me that owners of these buildings want to keep these streets like this, very full, full of holes and in bad condition, because then buses won't, cannot come to the, with ordinary common poor people cannot come to the beach near them. So the beaches they keep, the beaches which are public only for themselves because bad roads keep the poor off. Uh, and then you have James's photograph of Cachivaches, which is a, a, a place where you can buy things for the house in Colombia. It's a, a, like a department store, but it has all this section for maids and you can see all the, the dresses for the maids and everything. And this picture reminded me a lot that I was talking to a, a lady that runs a big uh, NGO, no, no, like a part of the city, like a council uh, for those who, to attend those suffering discrimination. And they had to rule this, they have thousands of cases which are all amazing about this kind of thing. And she was telling me that they had to rule on a class in the building, the, the building wouldn't let the maids or drivers walk around or go to the park or to go and take sun in the park of the, of the building 
because they would be mixed up with the, with the owners. So it, it was good to keep them apart so they couldn't go out only if they were walking the dog, otherwise they couldn't go out. So a kind of an apple life inside the same building and one of the owners actually protested and put a complaint, filed a complaint to Mexico City Council, but uh, they couldn't rule anything because this was a private space. But so another way to differentiate maids and to make sure nobody mixes up the maid with the lady of the house is to dress them up like this. Um, I think I'm going to be done now. Uh, this, this is, this is uh, the same story I was telling you about in Darien. We found these tombs in Akandi, another tiny, tiny town. And all these tombs are of immigrants who, who, who died in a, in a, in a, when the, the boats they were going sunk in, and, uh, and they were buried in this place um, with these crosses that you can see with no name, just numbers. And it became, I, we couldn't believe that they would bury these people whom they rescued from the sea, the bodies. They were children and women, and they wouldn't, didn't even bother to try and put the names of these people on or find out about with the survivors, who were these people, what were the names. And one of the men that I interviewed, one city, local city councilor, said that he thought if these were tourists from Europe, they would have never been buried without a name. It would have been a humongous deal and the government would have done anything to, to, to find everything, the family and everything. Uh, but because they were African migrants and some of them Cuban and some of them Haitian, they just completely didn't even realize. And my question is, why do we treat people from other countries as even poor people like people in Akandi who made this decision why would they treat people from other countries as they don't like to be treated themselves? So it is difficult from the point of view of a journalist how to investigate that, how to make it visible. How do we expand these his anecdotes into real stories that actually tell a story about an inequality that needs to change and somehow it's so embedded in the people that people don't realize how to change it. So that's, that's all, that's just my. Great, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk now. So, 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 so I, think, I think the idea here is very inductive, is, is just sort of trying to understand the quotidian practices, you, you know, you could say, it's the same word in Spanish, you know, like the, the, the sort of quotidian practices that reproduce inequality and difference and distinctions. And yes, you know, ultimately this ends up as, you know, the Gini coefficient as Maria Teresa was saying, but like for us, what's more interesting is just how society functions. You know, you just see this all the time in Colombia, people endlessly emphasizing these differences and distinctions and I'm not like you. And, and so, so what I find sort of fascinating about this is, is is that it, it differs a lot from, you know, what we're trying to do, I think, and what our understanding of what goes on in Colombia is very different from a lot of the academic literature. So let me just make three points about that, which reflects on what Maria Teresa was saying. One is, you know, in the United States, there's a kind of big ethnographic literature on poverty, but it tries to study poor people without studying rich people at the same time. So, so I find that in Colombia, I think that's a kind of bizarre agenda to study poor people without studying rich people because it's two sides of the coin and because they interact all the time. You know, I think this example of Leo Kopp, for instance, is just incredibly interesting. You know, so Maria Teresa showed a photograph of somebody, you know, praying to Leo Kopp. Uh, who was Leo Kopp? You know, he came from Germany in the 1880s and he started the first modern brewery just, just, just down the road from where I live in Bogota, actually. And he started a barrio called La Perseverancia. For, it was the first like workers barrio obrero, like a workers suburb, you know, and he bought the land and then he, he, he gave it to his workers and he subtracted from their wages the cost of the plots of land. So he created a sort of labor force. So in one way it was benevolent, but in another way he was also creating, you know, this docile, you know, dependent uh, 
clientelistic relationship with these people. And, you know, the whole story of Bavaria is sort of absolutely fascinating because when he took over that neighborhood, it was famous for its chicherias, like, like places that made kind of artisanal maize beer, like homemade maize beer, okay? And, uh, but that was a big competitor for Bavaria. Bavaria was making beer and Bavaria didn't want people drinking chicha, you know? And so what happened, you know, it, a little bit when Kopp was still alive, but afterwards, much more aggressively, certainly starting in the 1960s when Julio Mario Santo Domingo took over Bavaria, you know, was a ruthless elimination of all competition, okay? It took them until 1948, it took Bavaria until 1948 to eliminate Chicha, okay? Why 1948? Well, because until 1948, Chicha had been protected uh, by, by Jorge Gaitan, who was a very famous liberal politician. And there's actually a statue of him today in La Perseverancia. So he's another saint in La Perseverancia. Uh, so he protected Chicha. In April 1948, he was assassinated. And two months later, the conservative government made Chicha illegal. Uh, now in Colombia, 97% of all beer sold is produced by Bavaria. Okay. So on the one hand, there's this benevolent patron aspect of it. But there's also a very different other side of the coin, the creation of monopolies, the elimination of competition, the creation of docile, you know, patron client labor relations. So, you know, I think that's an example of La Perseverancia, what's that like today? It's absolutely horrible, horrible poverty, uh, violence. Uh, in a recent survey, 75% of people in La Perseverancia, La Perseverancia said they'd been robbed. Uh, mostly at uh, knife point, but also, you know, with guns. So it's a very violent, very poor uh, neighborhood. Uh, but people still say they're Beverianos. You know, there's people who are the descendants of the original people who came to work for Leo Kopp. So there's this intermingling of rich and poor. And that just seems impossible to ignore if you want to study this kind of in, in Colombia. Okay, so I think that's one thing that I see being very different from a lot of the ethnographic literature in the United States. Another thing, and this came up in Maria Teresa's uh, talk too, is different strategies. You know, I think like there's a lot of very interesting work about poverty and networks and how maybe poverty reduces your social networks. You know, it's been a big fact in sociology and a lot of labor economics since Mark Granovetter's work, Getting a Job that the way most people get a job is through their social networks. They get referred from a friend or, 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 or a relative or somebody has a job. And the problem with a lot of poor people is that they have, they have much smaller social networks. So it's much more difficult to get out of poverty. But again, what's extraordinary about that literature is it's not about politics. It's as if there were no politicians in the south side of Chicago. Now, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe there aren't, I, you know, but, but, but in Colombia, there are politicians. And I think if you ask people, you know, what's a, strate how, what's a strategy for getting out of poverty, you have to make a connection with somebody powerful, with a patron, with Leo Kopp, or with, 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 a, with, with a politician. Or, or, so, so the strategies, I think, are different. And again, the strategies emphasize this sort of interface between poverty and, and rich and, and poverty and wealth. And, and, you know, so it's not, you have to study inequality. And then the last thing I'd say, you know, which, which Maria Teresa was gonna talk about, but she didn't mention too much was, but was this, this issue of kind of norms and sort of internalization. You know, she did mention several times, you know, this is how it is, but people just kind of accept that this is a normal situation. You know, the army, the army guards El Cerejon or something. And then we, you know, this is a big coal mining company that runs like La Guajira in the north of Colombia. And that, that's, you know, no one cares about that. That's just sort of how it is. You know, so people kind of internalize this. And I think that one thing, again, in the academic literature in the United States, of course, there's a lot about social norms, you know, going back to this work in the 1950s and 1960s by Oscar Lewis on the culture of poverty. There's this idea that, you know, one of the causes of inequality is that poor people have dysfunctional social norms, which stops them experiencing social mobility, which stops them taking advantage of opportunities. And there's very 
influential recent uh, ethnographic work by Elijah Anderson, who's a very distinguished sociologist at uh, Yale, by Sudhir Venkatesh at Columbia, who's another socio sociologist, kind of documenting aspects of the culture of poor people that they say inhibits social mobility. But what I find sort of fascinating about the Colombian cases, I'm sure that goes on. I'm sure, you know, if you went to a, a comuna in Medellin, you know, you're going to find some dysfunctional aspect of youth culture or you could identify it. But what I find sort of, and, you know, and things go on like that. But I, what I think I find so interesting is that like my understanding, at least of the evidence in Colombia, the ethnographic evidence is that actually poor people poor people share the same aspirations, you know, as, as, as rich people. And many of the, you know, if you read like these famous ethnographies, like, um, you know, this, this the, the, no, I, I can't remember what the title is in English, but this Non Nasimos Pasemia, like this book, it's a kind of ethnography in Medellin of, of these kind of assassins, young assassins and gang members. They, they share, the whole argument in that book is, you know, they share exactly the same aspirations as mainstream Colombian society. And to the extent that they have dysfunctional social norms, it's dysfunctional social norms that, that characterize the entire Colombian society, not just some subculture and not just poor people, but also rich people as well. So, so this is not a case of, you know, of, of inequality being caused by poor people having dysfunctional culture. It's a, it's a case of kind of broad social norms within Colombia reinforcing the patterns of inequality. Why? Because it keeps poor people down and it allows rich people to exploit the rules. You know, so my favorite example of this uh, would be this, you know, no se a sapo, you know, don't be a toad. You know, what does no se a sapo mean? That comes up a lot in no nacimos pasemia. And it comes a lot in elite society too, in high society. What does it mean to be a sapo? It means like to tell, tell on somebody. If you see someone doing something bad, keep your mouth shut. It's none of your business, okay? And that, how, you know, how does that work? Well, it, it, it allows people to break the rules, you know, and, and the focus in the US on poverty is like, oh, poor people break the rules and maybe they become criminals or they start selling drugs. But in Colombia, the rich people break the rules just as much as the poor people and they're much better able to manipulate the rules to their advantage. So I think that's, that's an aspect of this that I find very interesting. And just one thing before I shut up, this was something Maria Therese and I were discussing yesterday, you know, about aspirations of poor people. You know, when you see the drug industry is a big source of upward mobility, you know, in Colombia. And, uh, and uh, you know, people who become very successful like the Rodriguez Orjuela brothers who were kind of running the Cali drug cartel, uh, what did they do? Well they became very rich, but they were not allowed to enter into the elite clubs in Cali. They were not, their membership application was refused. So what did they do? They built a replica club, like identical, you know, club for themselves, you know, and for their people because they, so they couldn't get into the real club. So they created a sort of, you know, doppelganger, a duplicate club. And, you know, so that's not rejecting mainstream aspirations. It's, it's absolutely embracing them, but but of course there's still these barriers, you know, that the nouveau riche can't get past. So so um, uh, we talked longer than I thought we were going to talk. So so the, you know this is very much work in progress and brainstorming, and perhaps yes. we should just pause. And, and I just wanted to have a little add something to say, James. That part of about social norms, and I do think that there's a lot that has been written and said about social norms among poor that don't allow, as you said, don't allow them to go up. But there's also a lot of social norms among rich that make sure they keep the, the poor at bay, that they make sure that, because you have not realized how violently the, re, the, 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 the big media and the, the, the the leaders of the country react every time somebody wants to create something that makes people equal. Like the Ciclovia, which is something we have in Bogota, which it's on Sundays and they close streets and everybody can go on the, on the streets. And, and to create that Ciclovia, there was so much pressure. Every time somebody wants to create a space, like, you know, know the spaces that we are equal, the street, the, 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 the the, um, the the beaches, the parks, it's always a battle, a battle. Every time they want to make a park, 
everybody in the neighborhood say, no, 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 because then who can come because this is a private, a public park. Um, so, and, and then there's this other idea of how the, the poor, the, not the poor, but what you were talking about, which is difficult to talk about these guys who are like fast upper class people because they came into something illegal or something and they make a lot of money. And they always knew that if you have like a traditional figure of the elite in a place, then everybody, all everything else will come. The state will come, the roads will come. Remember that? that case of, of, um, of uh, Vicente Castaño, who was one of the leaders of the paramilitary who said that, who said, the only way we can have this place fixed and have all the services is bring some of the rich from Bogota and then everything will start working here. And um, uh, so uh, that, that were just the two things that I wanted to say. So I don't know if there's questions or... No, I think we should, uh, we should let questions. Who's, who's in charge of that, Alex? Yes, hi, thank you so much um, for the presentation so far. Um, now we're gonna open up the question and answer portion to our virtual audience. And just a reminder that we really wanna encourage questions from current students. So if you would like to come on screen and ask your question yourself, just a reminder to press the raise hand function at the bottom of the window. You can come on video or just audio if you prefer. You can also submit your question in the Q&A function and I will ask it on your behalf. Um, so it looks like we're ready for Manuel to ask our first question, thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, Mary Teresa and James, I'm Manuel. I'm a recent Harris graduate. Um, I have a question on the example you mentioned in Cartagena of the of the maid that wasn't allowed to, to ride in the elevator with the, the other residents, because that reminded me of a famous uh, tutela that was filed by one, one maid in Cartagena and reached the constitutional court and the court said that that was to be kind of, that was illegal, that was discrimination and it was a very famous uh, case and ruling by the court. So, so I wanted to ask you first if you know that, that that's something that keeps happening despite of the kind of of the court's decision and also kind of you mentioned protests, but what do you think the role is in kind of curbing inequality of, of institutions like the constitutional court? There, there have been decisions like the one I mentioned with, with the maid, but also of people that want to go into like bars in Bogota and they are maybe poor or black and they are not allowed to go into the bar and then they file a tutela and then kind of the court says that that is discrimination and there's also a kind of this public kind of shaming of the bar after the decision is is reached by the court. So, so what do you think kind of the role is of the constitutional court in this case of kind of changing these social norms and maybe a curbing like inequality in, in similar case, cases? Thank I you. think you, you raised a super point, Manuel. I think that uh, the tutela, which is this kind of right of appeal, uh, it's like a super fast, fast track appeal when you feel your, your basic, your fundamental rights have been violated that Colombia's constitution included and it works. And, and, and in 10 days, when you, you do, you file this suit in 10 days, you have to have an answer, a decision by any judge in the country. And I think that is amazing. That's another, I think Tutela has been revolutionary in this way because I think it's been, a discovery for people to make, to feel equal, to have this capacity to go and say, you know, I'm equal, I have rights. And, and I think it has been used for everything, for health. And again, there have been about 50 attempts by the Congress, by the government to stop it, to, 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 uh, to dismount it, to destroy it, to stop it because, precisely because it, it gets so much of that um, of that uh, push from society asking to be treated equally. Regarding the, the kinds of cases like the, like the maid, uh, this was a few years ago, so maybe it was before the tutela, but actually I think it's very hard to, even if the court says it shouldn't happen, it happens because it's ingrained in people's way of living, you know? It's difficult, not just for, 
the people like like to discriminate, but also for the maids who are used to being treated like what they feel very uncomfortable. I was telling James another anecdote. It's so difficult to have a maid in one of the houses that has worked for years and years to just sit with you in the same table. They won't. They won't do it because they just feel completely out of place, completely uncomfortable. So this is like a two-way street and it's a hard embedded cultural thing. But of course the court has helped a lot yet. Thanks, Manuel. Next, we're gonna take a question from current student, Alejandro. Hi, um, thank you, Alex, and thank you, Maria Teresa and Professor Robinson. Um, this has been very interesting. I'm, I'm concerned basically about the very unfortunate parallels between Colombia and, and Mexico, Mexico City, especially where I'm from. And I'm just interested in a specific debate that has been going, a lot, going on a lot in Mexico between the distinction and interplay between classism and racism, right? Which are both terrible wrongs and terrible forms of discrimination. Um, but one of them, racism, includes this very inherent barrier that cannot be overcome in no way or fashion, right? It doesn't matter what you do to, to climb up the economic ladder, the race distinction will always be there. And I was just wondering if, if you believe this is an important distinction and if you believe that this is also something that occurs in Colombia. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Alejandro. I, it, you know, there is a big discussion I've heard about in, in academia and in other places and in journalism, surely. Oh, people like to say in Colombia, we have no racism. What we have is, what we have is, is classism. That's our real problem. We have a class, a difference of class, but I think there are both. I think, I don't know, I don't know what James thinks, but I do think that there are both. Uh, and I've been a lot to Mexico and I think it's much stronger in Colombia. And of course, numbers again, will tell you that the, 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 the departamentos, which are mostly black, are way below any average of the country. Um, they, they were, they got to a point that they didn't include them in one of the national statistics so that poverty wouldn't go so low. So they, they came as far as that to exclude Choco so that the country wouldn't look so poor. Um, so in, even in statistics, they've been discriminated. But I do think it's a, it's a mixed and very difficult thing. Now, regarding the class and the, the inequalities, the social inequalities, there is a kind of a stand, even if it's not racial, there is, it's in the culture and it's not because what James was saying that there's behavior in the poor that will make them look different from the rich. I don't think, and not in the case of Colombia because I think we share the same kinds of aspirations, but it's more about them being, it's more about them being uh, speaking differently. So if you talk to a Bogotano, you know exactly what class they come from because the way it's, they speak. Or, or even in the coast where it's a little bit more equal that way, it's difficult to tell. And so it takes a long time. It's more like, like a little bit like my fair lady, like that kind of thing. There is a difference in the way people talk and dress. I went to university and my, my classmate in the university we were, uh, we were at Los Andes, we, which is a, a private university, and we arrived together. And this man had a t-shirt of, of, of Brigitte Bardot and the, the first day of class. And immediately I could see all the teachers immediately treating him completely in a different way. And it was because he was perceived to be lower class and rather than the higher class. I think that has changed, fortunately, in the cities but it's very much in the smaller towns and it's very much still alive in other kinds of societies, not so much in like the most modern parts of Colombia, like Bogota or Medellin, but I don't know, James, if you want to say something about that class and race. No, no, I, I agree with you. I think that I think there's, there's horrendous racism uh, in, in, in Colombia, but, but I think, I think one, one of the things, 
you know, but I, 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 you know, obviously the lot of the academic literature in the United States has focused on racism and discrimination against black people. And, you know, and many policies that are targeted at black people like redlining or, you know, the construction of the Dan Ryan freeway, you know, here in our beloved Chicago, like which was designed to basically isolate black neighborhoods, you know, so, so they look at these very specific type of policies and I guess they don't, but in the United States, it, maybe it's just the ideology of the country, you know, they don't think of this as being something that infects everything or affects everything you know it affects i think in colombia you know so many poor there's so many poor people you know black indigenous mestizo you know whatever you know it, it's everywhere it cuts across everything half of the population is poor you know it's this hideous inequality it's just a much it just seems to us it's much more endemic in the way everything works in society whereas in the us it's sort of at least there's a there's a there's a there's a kind of ideology that this is just this is just a few residual problems you know that somehow we find it really difficult to solve but 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 it's as if you could kind of t disconnect it from the rest of society and i guess i our view is that you know in colombia it's very i don't know mexico so well but 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 in colombia it's very difficult to think of it like that and it's also it gives you a very biased understanding of its nature if you think of it as something you can disentangle from the rest of society Thank you. I think there's other questions there. Alex, what happened? Have you gone AWOL? No. We're here. We're ready to hear from Juan. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, it's Go ahead. Yes, it's, it's sorry. It seems that it yeah. changed a little yeah. bit the Zoom aspect, yeah. and that confused that me be, a little bit. Uh, uh, am I okay oh, sorry, to ask a question? Yes, you are. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to confirm. Uh, just thank you, Maria Teresa. Uh, thank you, James, for this space. Um, it seems Sorry. that inequality is at the center of the current political protests that we're seeing around uh, Latin America. And there's this feeling of people that of lack of representation. At the same time, I, I think that inequality is very intertwined with, uh, with this very protest that we're seeing around different Latin America countries. For example, uh, there are current reports from Peru's this week's uh, protest on how many protesters were harshly persecuted and apprehended by policemen in very poor districts, while one protest that happened and originated in a very rich district had the opposite uh, reaction from policemen who were actually protecting protesters. So I was just very curious, Maria Teresa, on what your views are on these interactions between discrimination and the current protest uh, movements in Latin America? I think you're right. I think it has a lot to do with different aspects of discrimination. So students march because they feel they're being treated unfairly. They don't have access to education in Colombia. Most uh, the, the space for a public education in, in the university is very restricted, very, very restricted. So a lot of people get stay out of university and a lot of the protests were pushed by the students. It was very interesting to see during the pandemic, my students here in Bogota, in the, they, were, they were trying to see the difference between the protests before the pandemic and the protests during the pandemic in Bogota. And that was in between September last year and, and just this past September. Uh, and what, you, what they found was, of course, before the people were obliged to be confined, people went to the main, main roads, the downtown areas. But in this case, the map was very different. And who was protesting? The only two neighborhoods in Bogota that were not protesting at all were the two rich neighborhoods or middle class. All the poorer neighborhoods had very strong protests 
because they couldn't move away uh, more than 10 blocks from their own house because of the confinement and the quarantine. So you could see exactly who was protesting. This time, people wouldn't get all mixed up in the, in the downtown like before. This town, it was people in their own neighborhoods. And you could see there is a lot of, of, of frustration by a lot of young people saying, look, we can't find a way to get out of this poverty trap like some of you are talking about. And then there's some are question are asking that, James. How to to, how to get out of the poverty trap, <laughs> which is because people protest, but sometimes protests don't, don't make changes. Okay, I think we have time for one more question and I'm gonna read one from the audience. Um, so we have one of our viewers asking about the role of constitutions as it pertains to these issues of inequality in Latin America that we've been talking about. Um, specifically, they're asking about the movement for a new constitution currently in Chile, but perhaps you could talk about Colombia and other countries um, more broadly. Well, the, the Constitution of 91 in Colombia was a, 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 an attempt to include a large part of the society. It was a product of a peace process. And of course, it was a huge, and there was a lot of parts of the Constitution, like the tutela, who have, have created, have man, or have tried to create a more equal kind of framework for the society. But then to, to have an effect on the culture, that's kind of difficult. I don't, I don't know about Chile because I don't know so much about Chile. I know it's incredibly also unequal. And I don't know how much this push for, for changing the constitution has to do with that, but also with the past, the, the past, you know, the, 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 the role that the military we're still playing with the old constitution left by Pinochet and all of this. I don't know if James, you want to say something about that because I don't know so much about Chile. Yeah, I could say something. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that in many ways, Chile, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the country with the highest income per capita in Latin America. And, you know, it's a country where many institutions work much more effectively than they do in Colombia, but it's also hideously oligarchic, uh, you know, if you, look, if you look at, I actually did an exercise a few years ago when I had to give a lecture in Santiago. If you look at the kind of economic and political elites, uh, half of them went to four Catholic boys schools uh, in Santiago. You know, none of them, one of them allowed admitted women for the first time 10 years ago. So, so you know, the, it's very, very oligarchic uh, Chilean society. And there's actually a wonderful piece of research by our former colleague at the Booth Business School, Seth Zimmerman. So look, look up Seth Zimmerman. And he did this fantastic study of the return to education uh, in, 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 in uni university education in Chile. And what he showed, it, I won't go into the research design, the research design was very clever, but the basic finding is there is no payoff unless you went to the right school. So, so you can get into a top university like the Católica or the Universidad de Chile, but it doesn't affect your future economic prospects unless you went to the right school, meaning unless you know the right people. So, uh, so, so I think you know that that so there is enormous frustration, you know, about the nature of Chilean uh, society. There's you know, thirteen percent of the population is indigenous, and they're completely marginalised. And I think there's enormous anger at the illegitimacy of the military constitution. So I think it's absolutely a fantastic thing. They go, it's not easy to, re, to rewrite constitutions, but, but I think it's a sign of, of progress in Chile. And, 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 and so it's, it's a very good thing. And I, but I agree with Maria Teresa also, you know, the 1991 constitution in Colombia is very imperfect, but there was, there was progress, you know, there was progress in some things with respect to indigenous rights and Afro-Colombian. Afro-Colombian people got, and indigenous people got collective title to their land, for example, and that's a huge, positive thing that came out of the constitution, but, but, but progress is slow. Uh, 
thank you again, Maria and James, um, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure, and I thank you all for joining us. I hope that you will join us in future for more Pearson events um, in this virtual space. This recording will be available on our YouTube channel in the next 24 to 48 hours. You can click the link in the chat now, or you can simply search the Pearson Institute on YouTube. Uh, thank you again, and I hope you all enjoy your day. Thank you.